Hey guys, this is Tommy from the Ravens Creek Study. I uh, thank you again for joining me. We left off last time looking at these two different ways to view the eternal covenant, also known as the New Covenant in the New Testament. And we saw that a lot of people have this idea that, you know, Jesus is kind of the marker that after Jesus is this New Covenant, also labeled with the New Testament. The Old Covenant in the Old Testament is everything before Jesus. And so those who lived under the Old Covenant had a different thing than what we have because the Spirit hadn't been poured out to be within people, but now it's the Spirit is in people instead of just upon people. And so there's this division in the mind where Old Testament, different. New Testament is distinct from the Old Testament. What we have is New Covenant. What they had was Old Covenant. And so there's this really elitist mentality that comes with that, just to be frank. But what I want to posit is that there's actually a different way of looking at it. That God rests on the seventh day, and we're going to look at Hebrews. And I'll get I'll get at this is where I'm getting where I'm getting this from. God rests on the seventh day, sanctifies it, thus creating an eternal rest, an eternal covenant on the seventh day. From that time forward, all of the saints who are truly saints, all of our heritage, all of those who are mentioned in, in Hebrews 11 and even those who aren't mentioned in Hebrews 11, all of them are part of this eternal covenant. The old covenant, that Sinai covenant, was established, was established as a pattern or as a reflection of the eternal. Once again, today we're going to get into Hebrews and you're going to see what I'm talking about. So Sinai is not necessarily bad, it's just not the perfect. The perfect is the eternal, and that's what we're a part of. That's what all of the saints have always been a part of. And that's why it's through faith and not through the law, because here's law, here's faith. It's this eternal rest. It's when you've entered that rest through faith. That's what we're after. And Jesus comes later. Jesus, once again, just the eternal covenant. This is the means by which we enter. So, <laughs> let's see if we can get into this. A Torah of Hebrews. The first chapter of Hebrews goes through the angels versus Jesus. We see Jesus is superior to the angels, but superior in what manner? Uh, in Hebrews 2, 2 and 3, it, it mentions how the, the old covenant was mediated through angels. But the new covenant is mediated through Christ. And so it's it goes through these superior, how Christ is, he existed before the angels, therefore he's superior. Um, of what angel has it ever been said, you are my son, today I give you, you know, of which of which angel has ever received that kind of praise from God? It's of the angels that he says, I make you ministering spirits. But that's not the case with Christ. Christ is superior. He's received a greater inheritance through his name, through the resurrection. And that's the important part. That's why it's, it mentions the old covenant being mediated through angels. Why is that mentioned in Acts 7 with, with Stephen, where he tells the people, we know that the Old Covenant was mediated through angels. Why is it this something that Paul also mentions? Not, not regularly, but mentions multiple times. Why is that an important detail? Because the mediation of angels shows that it's not the perfect thing of God. It's not the, the thing that was originally intended. What was originally intended was the rest of God, the covenant established through God, by God, for God, we included. So that's what Hebrews 1 is establishing. I don't know why that's like that. That's what Hebrews 1 is trying to establish. You then transition, you segue from Hebrews 1 into chapter 2, where the whole point of chapter 2 is to contrast you and I as human beings with the angels. So the first chapter contrasts Jesus with the angels. The second chapter, it continues that thought, but then starts to build upon it and says, but Jesus died for his brothers and not simply the subjects or the angels or those who are less than. He calls us brethren. And so there's a greater inheritance that we have received through Jesus. Is this starting to click for you here? Okay, Hebrews 3. 
Here's the comparison between Jesus and Moses. So we had the comparison of Jesus and angels to kind of compare New Covenant, Old Covenant. We have the comparison of Jesus and Moses. Just as the whole point, uh, so just as Jesus was before the angels and therefore is greater, so was he before Moses. And I'm going to go ahead and read uh, these verses so that you don't have to look them up. Hebrews 3, 2 and 3, and then 5 and 6. Uh, he, Jesus, was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. What's it saying? It's saying that Jesus is the builder of the house that Moses was over. <laughs> so here we have it that the author of Hebrews really is saying Jesus comes before Moses, therefore he's greater than Moses. The, the mediator of the new covenant came before the mediation of the covenant with angels, Therefore, the new covenant, the Jesus, is greater than the angels. The new covenant is greater than the old covenant. Um, Hebrews 2, sorry, Hebrews 5, Hebrews 3, 5 and 6, if I could learn to talk. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what he would be... Wait for the clock to stop chiming. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in, his, in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. Not as a servant in his house, but servant over God's house. Or a son over God's house. And we are his house if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. So you can, you can kind of see what's going on here. There's a comparison. There's to constantly the author of Hebrews. We're going to see it continuously. The author of Hebrews is saying, but... What we're a part of is something that goes before Sinai. And we see it in Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4 talking about the rest. Now, you have the rest of chapter 3 talking about how the generation that came out of the wilderness, uh, were, their bodies were scattered through the wilderness because of unbelief. And even that which came out with Joshua did not enter into the rest. Otherwise, as the author of Hebrews puts, Otherwise, David wouldn't have written, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. There's an eternal today. There's an eternal uh, if you hear his voice. There's an eternal moment in time, a, a transfixed moment, that as long as it is today, as long as there is an eternal today, we can continue to not harden our hearts and turn and listen and finally enter into that rest. And that's what the whole point of Hebrews 4 is about, to establish that rest and that we are able to enter into it and to encourage us to enter into it. This is why you read in uh, Hebrews 4.3, And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. So that goes back. That goes back to this slide. That's where I get this idea from. God rested on the seventh day. That's the eternal today. And that's why he says, and yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has also spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day God rested from all his works. You see the point here? This eternal rest, this this Sabbath, this Sabbath rest of God in, in Genesis chapter 2, uh, this precedes the Sabbath demanded in Exodus 20. In Hebrews 5 through 7, we see Jesus as the high priest, and he's of the order of Melchizedek. Well, Melchizedek comes before Aaron. So Christ is preeminent because he comes before Aaron. He's of the Melchizedek priesthood. Now, this Melchizedek is something interesting to note because you have in the Old Testament these uh, people who are offering sacrifices or eating the consecrated bread. Uh, Samuel offers sacrifices. Moses consecrated Aaron. How did Moses consecrate Aaron? He's not a son of, of Aaron. How is he a priest? He's not able to offer sacrifices. And yet it's the sacrifices of Moses that consecrate Aaron. How is this possible? It's because Moses was of a different priesthood. He's of this Melchizedek priesthood. 
the Melchizedek priesthood is greater than the Aaronic priesthood because it comes before it is the eternal paradigm. And so we can continue into Hebrews 8 through 10. And we have the quotation of Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, which following from that is the expansion of uh, this in the sacrifices that you have to notice. Um, Hebrews 8 starts by declaring, They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. Plainly put, the earthly reflects the heavenly, just as we've seen through the entirety of Hebrews so far. It is the earthly that reflects the heavenly. The earthly is not the thing in itself. It's not the end in itself. It's the eternal. It's the heavenly that we're after. So, when we look at Old Covenant, Sinai, Aaron, the, the priesthood of Aaron, the sacrifices of Leviticus 1 through 7, uh, the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath, the, the rules and regulations of consecration, of, of uh, purification, all of these things are only reflections. They're patterned after that which is eternal. And so what we have inherited is the eternal covenant. We are part of this eternal covenant. New Covenant, as Jeremiah calls it, New. And Jeremiah 31 is the only place, by the way, that you can see the word New Covenant, the term New Covenant. Everywhere else, it's Eternal Covenant. So, when you finally come to Hebrews 11, the crux of the argument here is that these saints who are explained in Hebrews 11 entered through faith and not by the works of the law. Well, that's great to know, but... The biggest point is that they were a part of the New Covenant with us. Because it wasn't through the works of the law. It wasn't through the sacrifices that they were justified. But they lived by faith, and the righteous shall live by faith. So they're part, So even though they were in the Old Testament, these Old Testament saints were actually a part of the New Covenant, of the Eternal Covenant, with us. And that's the whole point of the very last few verses. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect or complete. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Why? Because we are in something with them, and they are not on their own, but they are also imperfect without us. There is a weaving together of. We have been grafted into something already existent. So, when you come to Hebrews 12 and 13, this is kind of the resolution of the story. He starts to go into, therefore, since you're into this eternal covenant, here's how you ought to live. Here are the things you should do. Here are the things you should look for. Okay, and I wanted to read, I forgot about this, I wanted to read, and I'll finish up with this, um, Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. This kind of puts the whole thing into perspective for people, for me anyways. You have not come to a mountain that could be touched, and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged no uh, beg no further word would be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. That's not what you've come to. You've not come to that kind of old covenant that Sinai pact. You have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn. Notice, by the way, the word ecclesia, there for church, it comes from the Hebrew kahal in, uh, in Acts 7.51, I think. Stephen actually mentions the church in the wilderness, the ecclesia in the wilderness, to the church of the firstborn, Who's the firstborn? It's Jesus. <laughs> so that assembly that's always existed, 
That's to what you've come to, the thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the, to the ecclesia of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, not just you and I in the new covenant, but all in the Old Testament as well, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. That's the context of the entirety of the Bible. That's how we should be reading the Old Testament. That's how we should be understanding the Old Covenant. It's not by, um, it's not by comprehending, oh, the Old Covenant is law, it's just bad, it's, you know, we don't need to do that, that's, we're under grace now. That's not the way to read it. The way you read the book of Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy, the way that you read the last part of Exodus, the way that you read certain segments of the book of Numbers, the way that you read these things is by understanding that they are reflections of an eternal covenant, and that though they are not the end in themselves, they are still reflections, they are still patterns, and you can understand and comprehend something deeper of the eternal covenant by reading these and comprehending and seeing past just the words to the heart and the intention of God, asking the question of, if the reality is in heaven, what is this showing me? What's the reality in heaven that this is trying to show me? That's the way that you read the law. That's the way you read the Old Testament. That's the way you understand what it is that Leviticus and Deuteronomy are trying to talk about. So, with that said, for those of you who want to know how do you understand the book of Leviticus, because I don't even know where to begin, I have a playlist that I would recommend to you that goes through the entire book of Leviticus. I go through everything. I would recommend that to you if you don't want to uh, spend the time to go through it. You can try to read it in your own time and come to your own conclusions. Um, other than that, I thank you for listening to me. Grace and peace to you. And hopefully I can continue in this. I have a few ideas here, but I don't have anything uh, fully written out. These are all just notes for myself for later. Um, Thanks for listening again, and I will talk to you next time. Hopefully, we'll begin in Genesis 1 and start to go through the whole thing.